when I usually talk about uh, Afghanistan, it's usually in response to a question that sort of goes like, what's a sweetheart like you doing in a place like Kandahar? Um, what do you, you know, how did it come to pass that you wrote this book about Afghanistan? Uh, what have you been doing there all this time? Um, and why? And, and the, the, there's a bit of a paradox, is that I, um, I actually didn't set out to write a book about Afghanistan. Um, I tend to organize my life as though I'm writing a book. It's the only way I know how to kind of keep my notes in order and <laughs> sort myself out, whether it's a book or not. That's sort of the way I just sort of conduct my affairs. And the w how I do my journalism is very closely related to my, the inquiries that I pursue um, as a writer. And um, one of the things that has drawn me uh, to story, one of the things that I have been compelled by as a writer from uh, my earliest times as a cub reporter was uh, I'm always intrigued by those stories where there is a deep gulf between the real world and the way the world occurs uh, in the public conversation and in the media and so on. And it's not so much, I mean, it's interesting, it's useful as a reporter because you can, you know, the whole point of news is to tell people stuff they didn't know. So the stories like that are, there's often a lot of really low hanging fruit because people have certain ideas in their heads about the way things work. And what you can show is, guess what? It actually doesn't work that way. And it's, it's, it's fun and you can get, you know, page one story above the fold and you're a junior reporter and you think, great, I've done wonderful. But the other thing about those stories is that it's the, the, you know, the, the answers to the why question that I've always been compelled by and interested in and intrigued by. Why is there such a, dif a distance between a certain kind of a story and the way that story is, uh, is dealt with in the co public conversation and in the news media? And what I found uh, um, probably around 2004 2005, when I began to organize my work as a journalist as though I were writing a book on this subject, was that the, I had never in my life, never in my career, encountered such a deep and dark and disturbing and bizarre and confounding chasm between Afghanistan and the way we talk about Afghanistan, the way the media reports about Afghanistan. Um, and by the way, I'm not a critic. It's, I've seen in some reviews that I'm, I'm critical of the news media. I'm actually not. It's not quite that simple. I'm sur in fact, I, 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 I heap a tremendous amount of praise on journalists that have worked in Afghanistan, the very few Canadian journalists, very, very few who've spent any time there. Um, but there was that distance, it was that darkness, that gulf, that gap, that chasm. That was the thing that interested, in me, interested me most. And um, I first encountered it in a very simple way. Actually, at the time, I was writing a column for the Georgia Strait when I wasn't writing books. I'd left the Vancouver Sun and I was doing work for daily newspapers, but I had this little column in the Georgia Strait at the time. And, you know, the Georgia Strait and the kind of culture of, the, of, of Vancouver and uh, peace marches and so on, um, you, you would hear the way Afghanistan was discussed very broadly and generally, and the way Afghanistan and the, our engagement in Afghanistan uh, was understood, uh, particularly in late 2005, early 2006, when, when our soldiers were heading down to Kandahar. Uh, and then you'd talk to young Afghans in Vancouver, Afghan Canadians, you talk to uh, Afghan doctors, Afghan teachers, Afghan students, Afghan women particularly, and it was so different, it was so bizarre that I said there's something really interesting going on here and so I started filling up my notes, my notebooks with notes. And Scotty McIntyre, Douglas and McIntyre, you know, he's saying, well Glavin, what's your book, you know, what's, are you going to write a book or what? And I said, I don't know, I've been thinking about this book about, uh, uh, you know, right about Absurdistan, I was calling it. Uh, this strange country that, we've, that, that exists in, our, in the Canadian imagination. This strange war that we talk about uh, in the Canadian media. 
and how it doesn't really exist. This country that we talk about doesn't exist in the real world, and I find that fascinating. So I wanted to write a book about Absurdistan. And I wanted to, I, I ended up being, because I'm a person of the left, you might say. That's where I come from. And um, it was evident to me that the, if you did a little bit of archaeology um, in and around Absurdistan, the origins of this fictional country, it largely was a construction of the left. And um, what was also peculiar is that if you talk to any young Afghans or Afghan intellectuals, people of the Afghan left, liberals, secularists, reformers, women, they would talk about, they would weep when they talked about Canadian soldiers and how grateful they were and how proud they were to be Canadians. That Canada was really, really manning up and coming, you know, bringing something to the table. Um, very, very, very proud young Canadians. But you would talk to people in the, how shall I say, the white community, um, who fancied themselves to be people of the left or secularists or reformists or women's rights ad advocates, and they spoke a completely different language, and uh, they were totally troops out. And I never met any Afghan, and I still haven't, um, who could be vaguely described as progressive or on the left or liberal or secularist or reformist or a feminist, who, who was troops out. I've yet to meet an Afghan who, who's, who, who adopts that position. Um, so I thought that was pretty weird. So I talked to Scott about it and he said, well, you know, look, Lavin, if you're talking about all of these Afghan voices that we're not hearing, all these people that we don't know about, and this, you're actually going to have to, you know, make some room for those voices. And I said, well, that is kind of the point of my book. I see what you mean. But there's so many books about Afghanistan, my gosh. I said, you know, there should be a committee. And what do I know? I'm just this bloke. Uh, and then I realized when I started looking through my notebooks, you know, holy smokes, I've been there a couple of times. There's actually a lot of really in a, uh, interesting Afghans that I've met and spoken to. Um, you know, I've almost got enough for a book about Afghanistan. And then I went back a couple more times. And um, the result is uh, this lovely book, available on all your better bookstores, available at the back, called Come From the Shadows. And um, to give you an idea of what I mean by this gulf and distance, and we're all a bit guilty of it because we use shorthand. We talk about, for instance, the uh, invasion and, uh, of Afghanistan in the weeks and months following September 11th and the overthrow of the Taliban government and the, Afghan, the war in Afghanistan beginning the, around then. Um, actually, nothing of the kind ever happened. The first thing that you need to know is that there was no government in Afghanistan to overthrow that this thing called the Taliban, which was a joint venture, a criminal joint venture of some of the most lurid, jihadist, misogynist crackpots on the face of the earth, uh, a crime syndicate with Al-Qaeda, with Jordanian jihadists, with Libyan, Chechen, Algerian jihadists, was recognized at the morning of September 11th, 2001, by no government on earth except for the government of Pakistan. The only other governments that had ever recognized the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan uh, were Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and they'd already bailed by then. The government of Afghanistan that was recognized by the United Nations and indeed held the uh, seat of Afghanistan at the United Nations was the Islamic State of Afghanistan, which was headed up by Burhanuddin Rabbani. Can I have one of those bottles of water? Or something like that. Um, or maybe I've got one. There it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, that government, the legitimate government of Afghanistan, had actually been begging and pleading for NATO and foreign forces to intervene uh, for some time. Um, so, as far as invading a country is concerned, there was no so sovereign country left to invade. And to the extent that there was, the government of that country, such as it was, wanted us to be there. Um, and even so, it was actually the Afghans themselves who overthrew the Taliban. Uh, they did so before there were any boots on the ground, as uh, the, the, the phraseology has it. 
Um, a, it was a terrible, terrible thing, September 11th. You know what was also terrible? Pearl Harbor was terrible. Canadians celebrated Pearl Harbor on this coast. And it's not because we were happy to see the horrible thing that had happened to those Americans. It was because we knew that finally the Yanks were in the fight. Canada had been fighting in the Second World War for nearly two years before December 11th, 1941. And so when Pearl Harbor occurred, it meant great, finally the Yanks are in the fight. The Yanks are in the fight now. And there was the same kind of feeling in Afghanistan. September 11th was a terrible, horrible tragedy. Only two days before, the great Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was the leader of the resistance against the Taliban, was assassinated by an Al-Qaeda suicide squad. And then September 11th, after this terrible tragedy, set the skies open, and the planes were driven into the side of those towers and that horrible, horrible event. But the Afghans knew that the Yanks were in the fight. The Yanks were going to be back. And that put a spring in their step. And the Afghan, I mean, there was a bombing campaign and there were supply drops and so on. But <coughs> the, uh, the Afghans themselves actually chased the Taliban out of Kabul before any combat, combat troops came out. The, the Afghans actually chased the Taliban out of Kandahar before any American combat troops came along. So, and then when you talk about the war in Afghanistan, well, that's an interesting thing because in Afghanistan, when they talk about the war, they're talking about something that happened between 1978-79 and September 11, 2001. That was the war in Afghanistan. Since then, most of Afghanistan has been at peace. Um, this is a difficult subject for me to broach because I, uh, I have a bottomless respect uh, and affection for the Canadian soldiers that have made such sacrifices to this gallant cause. But it must be said that over the past 10 years, we have lost, when you add up the soldiers, the diplomat, the aid workers, and bless her heart, Michelle Lang, a reporter for the Calgary Herald, 164 people, I think, over a decade of involvement in Afghanistan. In the Second World War, we lost 60,000 people in half the time, five years, something like that, 50, 60,000 people. First World War, when our population was a third of what it is now, 70,000 people. <coughs> Something like that. So, war in Afghanistan. The closer you look at the way we talk about it, all, it just sort of falls apart. Everything seems to be backwards and upside down. And when you look at what the Afghan people are about, um, I am now aware of 16 different national public opinion polls that have carried, been carried out across Afghanistan over the last 10 years. They are now the most studied people in Central Asia, among the most studied people in the world. Um, focus group surveys, regional public opinion polls, and so on. And not once, and believe me, they have a lot more patience than I would, have, would be having at the moment with the Obama administration. Uh, not once uh, in that time has uh, anything less than an overwhelming majority of the Afghan people supported the NATO mission in that country. Not once. Last time I looked, the last poll that the um, Asia Foundation conducted, it's conducted eight polls in a row, uh, asking more or less the same questions. 82 to 85 percent of the people of Afghanistan support the rights, equal rights for all people regardless of religion, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity. Um, support the right of women to work outside the home. Support the right of women to run for political office. Um, the Quran burnings. Everybody's excited about the Quran burnings right now. This is an example of the kind of strange echo chamber, the weird hall, hall of mirrors that you walk through when you're looking at media coverage about, about Afghanistan. A very similar thing happened, and it's almost a replay of something that happened last April, actually. I'll talk about that first. Last April, people might remember Pastor Jones, this crackpot Floridian, I don't know what he is, who said, well, I'm going to burn a Quran. Um, he burned his Quran after this long lead-up. Afghans, meh, some guy burned a Quran. Um, and then simultaneously, about a week and a half after Pastor Jones burned his Quran, um, the propaganda office of the government of 
Tehran, of Iran, in, in, in Tehran, the Khomeinist Propaganda Bureau, on the same day, pretty well the same hour, uh, issued a statement with Hezbollah in Lebanon, and pretty well the same statement, almost word for word, uh, was issued by the Ark, the presidential palace in Kabul, about how horrible it was and what an insult to Islam it was that this Yank had been allowed to burn uh, the words of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, this was just three days before Karzai was making a trip to Tehran. And, um, you know, you can tell right away, you know, the protests in the streets of Kabul. You know who, they, who, who they've come from, who's organized it. It was Asif Mohseni, who's the richest mullah in Afghanistan, supported by Tehran, his mosque and madrasa and television station and radio station and newspaper. Uh, uh, and campus is uh, equal to the education ministry's budget for post-secondary education in all of Afghanistan. You can tell it was his guys in the street because of the black banners and because of the chanting Marg Bar Amrika, Marg Bar Yahud. Death to America, death to the Jews. Well, you know who it is. It's Mosseni. And so everybody gets worked up. And the same, and Mazari Sharif, where I had been only a few months before, and I was told, it's, this is a tinderbox and it's going to go up. Um, and it did go up. And it was totally manufactured. This last time around, you have to think of the, the, the sort of context. The context is that after uh, vowing hope and change and vowing to take Afghanistan seriously, unlike his Republican predecessor, um, this was a war that needed to be won, um, all this sort of thing. Obama basically walked into the Oval Office and said, how the hell do we get out of there? Um, a number of uh, senior policy people, everybody from uh, General McChrystal uh, were defenestrated. The last man standing was Joe Biden. Uh, fast forward the clock, and by the way, I'm sorry, but I think he's the dumbest Ameri American vice president to come along since Dan Quayle. Um, Fast forward a little bit and you, and, and, and you get the Americans saying, well, that was all very interesting, all that talk about women's rights and democracy. But um, we're going to actually revert to a Rumsfeldian policy in Afghanistan that is so cynical it would make Henry Kissinger blush. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety in Afghanistan. And you got the State Department buying condominiums for Mala Omar's crew, the leader of the Taliban, the uh, commander of the faithful of the, of the Quetta Shura in Qatar. You have the Pakistani ISI, which is the problem and always has been in Afghanistan, saying, yeah, we like this, we endorse this, and by the way, you've got to cut the Haqqani network in on the deal, because Jalal al-Din Haqqani is, after all, on the Quetta Shura, and Mala Omar went to the same school as uh, Jalal al-Din's dad, and so you've got, to get, you've got to give them a piece of it. Three days before the recent Quran riots, Galbadin Hekmatyar's people, um, issue a statement. Now, Galbadin Hekmat Yar's people has be Islami. We use this term Taliban, kind of generic. Something bad happens, the Taliban did it. The Taliban is actually a little bit more complicated than that. A lot of the, uh, the outrages attributed to the Taliban are actually more accurately attributed to Galbadin Hekmat Yar's has be Islami. So, two days before the recent, uh, three days before the recent uh, riots and rumpuses over a Quran burning, you have Gulbuddin Hekmat Yar's spokesman referring directly to the engagement of the Pakistani ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, the gruesome generals that run that country that masquerades as a UN member state, um, doing these deals in Qatar and, uh, and, and, and the Taliban being cut in on it. And he said, well, look, nice filthy little capitulation you got going for yourself here. It would be a shame if anything happened to it, wouldn't it? Uh, we want our peace. And uh, because, you know, Afghanistan is a very easy place to, de to destabilize. Bob's your uncle. Three days later, the place is erupting in Quran burnings. And this isn't just my little theory, by the way. I spoke at length a couple of weeks ago with Amrullah Saleh, uh, who was the head of the National Directorate of Security, uh, in the sp legendary Afghan spy chief, Amrullah Saleh. And also um, 
Abdul Faik, who tracked and traced the epicenters of these Quran riots and the violence. And even in the north, um, which is outside of the Pashtun belt, um, the, the, the riots were occurring in areas of, 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 of ethnic pockets of Pashtuns where Hezbi Islami was known to have a significant degree of support. So, you talk to Afghans and it's, well, you know, yeah, we didn't like to see the Quran get burned. I mean, what Christian would like to see a Bible get burned? Of course it's upsetting to us. What do you think? But riots? What would we want to riot for? 99% of the people of Afghanistan, they're not going to riot about this. Uh, and they're actually more angry with the people who are doing the rioting. So I think it's really important for us not to have a romantic idea, but have a complete, a more complete and honest and straightforward idea about what we really mean when we're talking about Afghanistan and the Afghan people. And I'm going to conclude with a couple of things. Uh, I just want to make a few comments about China. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to say the one opinion that I have, really, about, about Afghanistan and its prospects for the future. And it's the only opinion I've ever really had. And that is that what we say about Afghanistan, and by we I mean the rest of the world, particularly the democratic world, particularly countries like Canada, what we say about Afghanistan, and what, about Afghanistan and what we say to Afghans matters more than all the guns and the money that everybody has sent there since September of 2001. Because they're not stupid. We talk about the battle for hearts and minds and we forget the minds part. They have minds, they have ears, they can smell betrayal a mile away. And when all they hear is, oh, look, pick up a copy of Hashti Sob, the wonderful liberal Kabul Daily, and there's another disturbing story about an anti-war demonstration on the front page in Toronto. When what they hear is Barack Obama saying, well, you know, it was all very interesting, but we're kind of broke and uh, we're just interested in beating the crap out of Al-Qaeda and we don't care what happens to your wretched little country. Um, when they hear troops out, man, what happens is that Hezbi Islami, the Ketashura, the Haqqani Network, the Ulema Council, all the grisliest, most wretched gargoyles that have tortured and tor tormented that country over the last 30 years say, okay, well, we told you, didn't we? We're waiting. We're, we're here. And what happens if you're a, a young socialist, a young libertarian, a young liberal, a young democrat, a young secularist, a young reformist, what happens if you're a women's rights leader? What happens if you're Fauzi Akufi? What happens if you're Sabrina Saqeb? What happens if you're Seema Samar? Parliamentarians, leading Afghan women. And by the way, this is International Women's Day, so let's not forget that, all right? What happens to them when they hear this kind of language? Well, you know, we're thinking about just sort of packing it in. I don't know about all this democracy stuff. You wogs and fuzzy wuzzies don't seem to get it. That's what they hear. They're not going to stick their necks out. And the cycle of corruption. I mean, please, you're a planning officer in Jalalabad. Some lurid money bags comes into the office and says, I want to put this uh, you know, water filtration plant over here or a subdivision over there. I need permission to drive my, you know, put a big road through these neighborhoods, drive everybody away. You know, here's a little satchel for you. Uh, you can buy yourself a... a, a a, a nice little condo in Bahrain. Um, what are you going to do? You're going to say, look, I might as well get it while the getting's good. So, unfortunately, um, putting your back into it and, and making a commitment that liberty and democracy actually do mean something. And these are not Western values that we're trying to impose on Afghans, please. These are Afghan values. These are universal values. They matter. Um, and so long as we're talking about retreat, so long as we're, oh gosh, we shouldn't impose our values on them, so long as we're saying, well, gee, you know, George Bush's wars, Afghans are going to do what you would do, what anybody in this room would do.
Okay, the laws of gravity don't operate differently in Afghanistan. Now, what does Beijing see in this? This is what Beijing sees in this. Mark Grossman, I guess his name is, he's the AFPAC envoy now to, so appointed by the State Department last month, goes to uh, Rawal Pindi, talk to, talks to the generals, goes to Islamabad, wants to talk to the senior generals, the ISI people and people in Zardari's office. Made to wait in a corridor for an hour and a half. Somebody comes up, oh yeah, you're, that, you're from, what is it, United States of America? Yeah, that's some country north of Brazil, isn't it? Yeah. We remember now. Um, actually, we're too busy to see you. Too busy to see you. Um, give us a call in a month or two. Uh, and by the way, China's got our back now. <coughs> That's what's going on in Afghanistan. When you look at all of the money that the West has contributed, the United Nations has contributed, the Americans have contributed. $33 billion, say, is what the NATO countries have contributed just to aid in Afghanistan over the past 10 years. How much has China contributed to that? About six-tenths of one percent of that amount is Chinese money. And that's just what's been pledged. What's been, the Chinese have actually spent in aid in Afghanistan over the past decade is more like one-fifth of one percent of that amount. All right? Tonga has given more money to Afghanistan than the People's Republic of China has. And what are they doing? They've just bought the, you know, they've, what have they done? It's since, to, since the Obama's election, 2009. 2008-2009, they've uh, 3.3 billion, I think it was, they acquired a little bit more than that, the um, INAC copper, the, probably the largest deposit of copper on earth. Uh, the INET copper deposits. They've made all sorts of promises that they've already broken. They over outbid and overbid everybody else just to get in there. They, p they allegedly bribed the mines minister with a, 30, a little $30 million nosegay, and I wouldn't doubt it. Um, they uh, have made an arrangement with the uh, Pakistani generals uh, to secure the port of Gwador. It's difficult, by the way, a map of Afghanistan, if you can imagine Afghanistan and, you know, it's landlocked. And then you've got Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the stands, right? Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, above it. And then you've got Iran to the west. Don't get me started. And then you've got Pakistan to the east. But Pakistan also sweeps around underneath Afghanistan along the coast of the Arabian Sea in occupied Balochistan. And the Baloch people were, the, and Balochistan was annexed by, by Pakistan in 1947. They've never wanted to be part of the country. Um, over the last couple of years, in order to secure the port at Gwador, saltwater port at Gwador, the Chinese and the Pakistanis have seen to it that several thousand, maybe 10,000 Baloch student leaders, tribal leaders, Democrats, reformists, secularists, have been tortured, jailed, executed, and disappeared. And it is only through a free Balochistan that an Afghan, a sovereign and independent Afghan republic is a possibility, so long as the generals are in charge of Pakistan, so long as the Khomeinists are in charge of Tehran. There's only one way out. There's only one way to salt water anyway, and it's through Balochistan. So the Chinese, what do they do? Well, you know, they've actually made it very clear. They've always been this way. Um, they want to guard against strategic encirclement that would involve anything in, to do with the Indian government, the government of India or the United States. They've always been in league with the, uh, the, the, the Pakistani generals. Uh, they, uh, they want to engage in their own form of strategic encirclement of India. Um, they want everything that Afghanistan has got, and they're getting it. And um, I'm not in favor of the regime in Beijing. I don't care for them. I don't care for a regime that, 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 that behaves in this fashion. I don't care for a regime that orders live rounds of bullets to be fired into unarmed Tibetan monks the very morning you're meeting 
Canada's Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Don't care for it. And I don't know why we should. And I don't need to be lectured and told how necessary and wonderful it is to have trade relationships with China. I'd love to see deeper and more intense, more intimate trade, economic, cultural, academic relationships between Canada and China. That's not what this is about. What this is about is um, the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, um, whose appointees run Sinopec, Sinoc, PetroChina, which are the three most notorious sanctions busters in Iran, and have which, which have been drawn to the bosom of our own Prime Minister in the oil sands. Uh, I'm not, I don't care for this. I'm not in favor of it. And I don't won't know why I would have to apologize for that. That, um, that uh, the Central Committee, the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, has entered into a cultural, political, economic, and strategic pact with jamaat e islami in Pakistan, the largest Islamist front in, Af in, in Pakistan, the source of the problem, the people who run the madrasas that are still pumping out 250,000 crackpots every year. They've got, ev they've got it covered, and they do not scruple. And I don't know what this means or where it leads, but, um, you know, we were talking earlier, it seems to me that, I'm just wrapping up, that um, it, would be, it might be an interesting and useful thing if the liberal democracies of the world, maybe I shouldn't be so optimistic, North America, how's that? The, the signatories to the North American Free Trade Agreement had something of a united front. When you are dealing with a government that we are lately being told is Canada's gateway to prosperity in China, which also happens to be, in Iran, the Ayatollah's gateway to a nuclear bomb, which also happens to be the bottomless bank draft and the limitless credit line of Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, which also happens to be the reason why Omar al-Bashir is still in power in Khartoum and not at the criminal court of The Hague in the prisoner's dock on charges of war crimes. Sinopec, Sinoc, PetroChina. And you know, like I said at the outset, what do I know from economics? All of these interesting political economic conversations that people will have who like free trade, who like small markets, who don't like uh, government intervention in the economy. Seems to me it wasn't all that long ago when people of that bent we're talking about how wicked and cruel and stupid it was that the federal government was nationalizing Canada's oil and gas industry and that we'd established this huge Maoist entity called Petro-Canada uh, and this interfered with private markets. But somehow when the Chinese government does it and it's the Chinese government doing the nationalizing and it's Petro-China instead of Petro-Canada, somehow it's okay. Maybe somebody could explain that to me because like I said, it's only recently I discovered it was buy low, sell high. That's my talk. Thanks.